So with mindfulness practice, um, what I've come to see is that it's a helpful tool and technique to scaffold into awareness. If you haven't noticed, and most of you probably have noticed, that when, um, when we say things like, okay, let's be present, um, it's easier said than done to just be present. And what does that really mean to be present? A mindfulness practice gives us the tools and techniques, skillful means, so that we can see what's happening in our experience in a way that puts it into parts and different pieces so that we can see the whole picture. But sometimes it's hard to see the whole picture without seeing the pieces first. Mindfulness practice gives us these tools and skillful means to start to see what's happening in any given um, frame or picture that we are contemplating about, um, inclining towards seeing more clearly. That's the aim of the practice really is to see more clearly what's happening in our experience in any given moment and see how these different parts of us, thoughts, emotions, body sensations, breath, how all this interact and intermingle and form our sense of who we are, our sense of self. And that's a big word in Buddhist psychology and in um, the Buddhist wisdom tradition. It's also um, a big concept in psychology. And um, what I've seen in the West through my you know, 15 years of, of studying Buddhist practice and being in the mindfulness movement is that we are still coming into how to, how to understand this sense of self and how to translate it from one field to another field. It's not always easily um, translatable. And from what I see, too, is that that is part of what we're doing with each other as humans is learning how to translate our experience. And it's not always easy to translate our experience. You might, have, you might know this from being in relationship with people. It's one thing to sit quietly and say, okay, hearing, seeing, touching, smelling, but then to actually get into a relationship and describe what it is that we're seeing, what it is that we're touching, what it is that we're smelling, so that we all can connect. That is, we, we do this in various ways, and sometimes that's not all easy. Um, but starting with mindfulness practice gives us a scaffolding kind of approach so that we can see more and more and more and hopefully um, gain a deeper understanding of how this all works and fits together. One of the ways that we do this is by breaking our experience down. And when we break our experience down, meaning when we label or name, or recognize, know what's happening, Seeing, hearing, breathing, feeling, talking. When we do this and we're able to recognize it and know it, we're also seeing the patterns that are that's you know laid out in our experience. Some of them are habits that we start to see, oh gosh, like I do that automatically without even cognitively or mindfully knowing what's happening. I do that automatically. But when we break things down, then we start to see this thing leads to this thing that leads to this thing that leads to this thing. And then before long, we have this chain reaction in our experience. And with mindfulness practice, we learn that at any given moment, we can wake up to any part of that chain. And we can see, oh, thinking, oh, anger right now. Oh, that's a pain in my oh, chest right now. And if we recognize that like Sharon Salzberg says a moment of mindfulness is a moment of freedom that's the aim when we recognize that have that ability to observe which is mindfulness that this is happening then we can break the chain reaction we can change those automatic habits um, and we can choose something different it's one of the only qualities that we have that I know of that cognitive recognizing capacity the knowing that allows us to influence our experience. We can't control it. This is the, this is the, um, the mystery here is, is what's in our control and what's out of our control. Um, there's a scene on Frozen 2 where Olaf, the little snowman, um, right after they have disturbed the magic and, and the castle is you know, um, 
blowing up and everybody's exiting the town and it's chaos. There's a scene where this little snowman, all the children are laughing and playing because they don't quite get it yet. You know, how there's that, that sense with children that sometimes we don't really get reality. Well, we have that too, that we don't really get everything that's happening. You look at the crumbling that's happening in our world right now. There's no way each one of us knows the extent of that. So in some ways, um, you know, with that little snowman and frozen, all the children were like putting things on him and decorating him and, and having fun with him. And he's like, Oh my gosh, I call this trying to control when everything is out of control. So trying to control what we can when everything is out of control. Mindfulness practice gives us a little bit of a sense of that, um, that we can stabilize through concentration so that it's not so disorienting when we start to break our experience down and see more clearly what's happening. Because when we start to break our experience down, seeing, hearing, thinking, then we're also starting to get that space of freedom. And then we're also starting to have insight into how things are really working in our experience. Um, and a lot of times we don't really understand that fully. Um, so we start to have insight into impermanence. And this is where things shift from concentration practice into inclining towards insight or mindfulness. The shift is in what we're looking for, um, what we are sensing into. So it's impermanence is one of the main key big things that we start to see very clearly. And the deeper that we understand this and become familiar with it and intimate with it, um, the more freedom we really have in our experience, the less we struggle with it. So impermanence leads into insight into suffering. You'll hear that word a lot in Buddhist psychology. And it's not that everything is always grim and dire. Um, we actually, the, the teachings point to the freedom of suffering, okay? So it's the acceptance of certain levels of suffering that we're all going to die, we're all going to get sick, you know, we're all going to get old, hopefully. Um, and, and then at the same time, there are things that we can't control and that we can't change. And so through this practice, we learn that things are always constantly changing through impermanence. Our sense of self is really always constantly changing. Um, and then we see um, how we create our own suffering. So Shenzhen Young has a simple formula. So, so those that <laughs> you that like those formula kind of equations. So just a reminder uh, for those of you that already know it, it's pain times resistance equals suffering. So through mindfulness practice, we learn, yes, this is painful. All right. This existence in life is painful. There's no way out of it. Um, there we are, are all are experiencing a lot of pain right now in our current situation in the world and it trickles into our personal lives each one of us right now so that's going to be here and that's a reality um, we can resist that and we will because we're human and that's a natural part of our experience is there's moments where we resist and brace ourselves against that um, and yet, if we keep doing it, if we keep adding on top of our basic experience, then we are spinning out and creating more ways of suffering that we just don't need. Part of the way that we do that is added additional lines of thinking. We just don't need some lines of thinking anymore. Um, like, I'm not doing this right. I'm not good enough. Um, I'm never going to get this. Like, some of those internalized patterns of thinking through mindfulness practice we can see directly through them and they might come we see them and then they go all right so that's part of what we're tuning into now in mindfulness practice is the arising and the passing of everything in our experience from the sensation level to the thinking level to the feelings and to how all of that comes together, our breath arises and passes in any given moment. And this practice can tune us into that from our very, very, um, like a minuscule level, um, the, a little level of the atoms. If concentration gets so strong, you really can sense this. I've been on long retreats with lots of concentration, a lot of silence for two months, and the vibrations that happen in our body the light, the way that our thoughts come and go. Everything happens so fast that most of us, we, there's no way that we can perceive that 
in, in our just everyday current reality. When we heighten these factors like concentration, then we can start to see like a microscopic laser um, how, how um, finite and ephemeral our experience really is. And that brings us more into here right now. Because here right now, even if a memory comes from the past, it's arising right now. And if mindfulness is strong enough, it can be with that memory from the moment it comes up, for the time that it lasts, that it's alive, that it's here, that it's birth, until the moment it dies. So birth and death is happening in our experience all the time. All right? With mindfulness practice, we start to see that. We start to see how it bubbles and how it, and it, how it falls away. Jack Kornfeld and, and Tara Brock, they say a lot of like, you know, it, it expands and it contracts. It expands and it contracts. Um, and that's what our experience does all the time. And sometimes there's expansions within the contractions. Um, and as we see, okay, this is thinking, this is feeling, this is sensations, this is how it fits together. This is life. Knowing life is like this. Being alive is like this. So this process of identification that we learn about through mindfulness practice is really important. We can learn through mindfulness where we get um, sucked in and where we start to have rope burn with our experience, where we're actually clinging to it and not letting it move through. All right. And there's various reasons we don't want our experience to really move through or we like tense up against it or we um, want more of the pleasant sensations. Um, but really, when we can just hold this lightly, because it arises and passes, just like hold it lightly, like a bubble in a dream is one of the classic sayings. Um, then we have the capacity to respond in different ways than we would have if we are constantly trying to, to change things or manipulate it for our own personal comfort. It just doesn't work like that. Um, there's not a lot of happiness and a bigger sense of the word to be found in the struggle like that. Because it will break us through when we see this over and over and over again it will point us towards noticing and recognizing awareness, that which does not change, that which does not move, that which can hold everything. So we have mindfulness, the knowing, that starts to elude and break us through into the awareness. And both of them together, that's empowering. That's where um, the empowering part of being alive really starts to come into focus. So <clears throat> from this traditional book, I'm just gonna read you just a little bit of um, things from this book. And you can just take what lands for you and what doesn't. So this is the Satipatthana, um, the direct path of realization, Analio. I highly recommend it for those of you that want to just get a classical understanding. In this book, he says, direct experience of the fact that everything changes, if applied to all aspects of one's personality, can powerfully alter the habit patterns of one's mind. So that's what we're aiming for, is to powerfully alter the habit patterns of our mind, including the habit pattern that, that creates this sense of tunnel vision or isolation, that we're alone, that we're not interconnected, um, that we're not able to incline towards awareness in any given moment and that it's here for all of us. So in the tradition, um, in the Buddhist psychology, sati and mindfulness, you'll hear sati as the word, and it's translated into mindfulness. And it's the quality that allows wisdom to arise. So keep that in mind too as you're practicing, you're also allowing for wisdom to arise. 
sati is also that ability, like I said before, to look over and to observe your experience. So the steps of mindfulness practice, first you're absorbed in it and you can't see it. And so then when there's the recog recognizing it or knowing it, then you have that space, so then you see it. So that's mindfulness, the ability to observe. And then the next step is what we talk about a lot is to be with it, to be able to be with the sensations and directly sense it instead of just at a slight distance. So there's actually three parts. Right now we're really focusing on creating that space and that distance. So he also says that when we are able to create that distance, we also gain our ability to hold cognitive dissonance. All right. So that's important too, because as you start to see your experience clearly, you're going to start to have those moments where things don't actually make sense to your rational and logical mind. That is normal. So in this process, I really want to invite you to hold your rational and logical and cognitive mind gently because it's going to um, get scared eventually of what it's seeing because it's not going to make sense completely until you move through it in a little bit more. But if you do have that sense of mindfulness and can recognize cognitive dissonance, then it, it, um, it will allow you to hold that in a way um, that continues to deepen and you'll move through it. It won't sweep you over. He says that sati is the one factor that guards the mind, able to exert controlling influence on thoughts and intentions. So here's also an important practice pointer. Sati silently observes like a spectator at play without in any way interfering. Some refer to this non-reactive feature of sati as choiceless awareness. Sati does not change experience. It deepens it. All right? So part of what you'll need to be noticing is all those times that you want to change experience. That's not sati. Any movement towards or away from it, manipulating it, if that's not it. It's, that, it's just the ability to see things arising and passing. And it's the ability to actually see the ways that you want to interfere with it too. But mindfulness is not interfering. That's a lot of times you'll hear non-judgmental as a quality of mindfulness. Doesn't mean that judgment cannot arise and pass. It just means that the quality of mindfulness itself isn't interfering with the process. So bare attention is also a really important part of mindfulness practice, and that's the ability to just rest your attention with the bare experience of what's happening. And this is really important. So not adding anything on. He says bare, atti at bare attention aspect of sati, this ability to just like let your attention rest right now with your hand if, you, if you're willing to do this. Gently resting on your hand, noticing the front of your hand, the back of your hand, the middle part of your hand. You're not pushing, no pulling, just that bare attention resting gently. This, he says, has intriguing potential since it's capable of leading to a de-automization of mental mechanisms. So just that simple ability right there to rest and bear attention can lead you to quite a powerful process of changing your habits. <laughs>